Hey everyone, welcome back to another video from CrowdRender and today we're looking at external GPUs. So we have a Razer Core X external GPU enclosure here and also we're going to be testing that with a Radeon 5700 XT video card and trying to answer the question of is this something that you would want to consider as an upgrade potentially. We're going to be testing it with Blender and also with DaVinci Resolve and just seeing how it's like to use one of these things and is it worth looking at. Before we get into it though, I really want to say a huge thanks to M-Wave Australia for providing all of the equipment that we have here. They've been instrumental in helping us make these videos and also supplying kit for us to do development with. So, big shout out to those guys. There's a link to their store in the description below where you can pick up one of these for your very own if you so desire. And they've also got tons of other stuff too. Go check them out. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is just remove the internal caddy. So put the graphics card over there. Okay, so this just slides out nice and easy. Before we get the card installed, um, we've got obviously our power supply for the graphics card. And we've got our cables here. So we've got two eight pin cables and obviously a cooling fan and the slot where the graphics card gets installed. Also, if we have a look on the back, I'll turn this into the light so you can see. Um, it's fairly simple. We've got the cutout for the card here, and then we've got one Thunderbolt 3 port, which is how we're going to connect it to our host machine, which will be a MacBook. That's what I've been using. So I'm going to show you that whole setup when we get there, but first we've got to get this graphics card installed. So I'm just going to take out the retaining screw. It's pretty cool, this setup, because it's toolless. You know, you don't need any tools to assemble anything. Okay, so we've got a very chunky 5700 XT from Gigabyte or Aorus, one of the two. So we're just going to line this up. All right, so in that goes. Okay, so it's lined up with the slot. And I'm just going to slot it in like that. Put the retaining screw back in. Let's check everything looks good. Now we're just going to attach the power. One, and then two. This is a bit fiddly, but luckily I only have to do this once. Okay, so that's all the power connected. And now we just have to put it back in. Just open this handle out, push it home, and that's it, it's done. So now we can actually get it set up uh, with the host machine, which I'm gonna go grab real quick, and we'll give this a test. And we'll go from there. We'll look at some test results and get this thing on the road. All right, so there's one scruffy looking MacBook and this little thing I'm quite fond of, but it is somewhat of a MacBook Pro-tato now. And pretty much the motivation for testing this out was, can I make working on this in things like Blender and DaVinci Resolve actually doable? Let alone pleasant, just workable. So we're gonna get this thing set up. We need a few things first though. We're gonna need an adapter because this is Thunderbolt 3 or USB-C and this MacBook only has the Thunderbolt 2 ports but it does actually work which is pretty cool so the adapter just goes into the small port on the back and then this can just get plugged into one of the ports. I'm going to leave that until I've got power on though. I've also got myself a little uh, electrical meter here plugged in so I can see how much power this thing actually uses. Okay so we've got power, Let's switch it on. One of the cool things about this is it is pretty damn quiet. So if you're in a situation where you want to be recording, I'm not sure if you can hear it. It is a bit louder when it's actually in operation, but not by a huge amount. Okay, so before we plug in, I just want to say a little bit about setting up the host machine. Depending on what platform you're using, whether it's Windows or Mac OS, it kind of differs as to how much pain you've got to go through to get this whole thing to work. For Macintosh systems which have Thunderbolt 3, so, you know, a device that looks, or a socket that looks like this, it's pretty much just plug and play. Um, in my case, I have an older MacBook which has Thunderbolt 2, as you can see, it's a different connector. This is a little bit more difficult. You can get it to work though with some scripts, and I've left some links in the description below if you're in the same situation and you want to give this a try. You do have to disable things like system integrity protection and secure boot, so you might want to look up if you actually want to do those things. Um, but I've done all this and it works really great. For those of you who are in the same boat as me with a Mac with Thunderbolt 2 ports, this is how you run the scripts I was talking about. You download them from the links in the description below. I choose to use Purge Wrangler because Purge Wrangler worked for me, the other one did not. You put the Purge Wrangler script somewhere, then you just run it by typing its name like that. You have to put your password in. Then it's pretty much 
easy from here, I guess. I choose to escape from the detecting the eGPU automatically because it crashes on my system and there's a manual backup for that. I said no to TI-82, um, check the documentation for why you should do that. I also say no to AMD legacy support and that's pretty much it. You just put in the option for what GPU you've got. Uh, mine was AMD, so I selected one and then it installs everything and pretty much you just do a reboot and you're good to go. Okay, so pretty simple. Everything's ready to go and we just plug it in. And then you've got to wait a few seconds. You can see it's already been recognized. Let's have a look at idle, we're drawing Sort of about 24 watts, which is, I guess, okay. I mean, my entire MacBook probably would draw something similar. So it's a lot less than, let's just say, you know, I've got a new PC and that draws about sort of 90 watts at idle. So for a power consumption comparison, this isn't actually too bad. Okie dokes. So we're going to be using Blender 2.92. I'm using Pro Render today, not Cycles. That's mainly because Macintosh. Our oh, uh, operating system no longer supports OpenGL or OpenCL, and that means that AMD cards, of which this is one, no longer can render with cycles because you had to use OpenCL as the render device to get an AMD card to work. That's a bit annoying, but it's okay because we've got ProRender. So ProRender is AMD's own render engine, and you can see here it has no trouble recognizing the card. So let's use that. I've got a benchmark scene, which I've been using um, both in the article that I wrote, link in the description below, and also um, just for little tests like this. So I'll just hit render, and then hopefully we can watch what happens to the power consumption. Okay, now it's rendering. So the peak power there was about 180 watts. Well, 177, but yeah, rounded up to 180. So we repeated this test a few times with the same scene. And then we averaged results, and this is what we got out of the box without any modifications or tuning or tweaking. We got one tenth or thereabouts the render time, which was just awesome. And also what you'd expect, you know, we've got a very capable GPU versus a CPU from a long time ago. So this makes a lot of sense. However, what was kind of concerning is when we put the same card in a PC, and here's the PC, by the way, that we put that in, we got about half the performance. So obviously we were keen to do a little bit more digging. And as you can see from the charts, the difference was actually the synchronization time and cycles, which you can check a link in the description below if you want to learn what that is. Essentially though, we found our scene was just too big to fit in the puny eight gigs of RAM that my MacBook has. So we shrank the scene down by using a smaller HDRI texture. Everything else was the same. And you can see from this graph now that the performance is almost exactly the same as if it was sitting in the PC. The only performance difference now is the fact that the PC has PCI Express 4, which is a hell of a lot faster, I think anyway, than Thunderbolt 2. So that probably accounts for the difference in performance now. So all good, moving on. So in this next test, I looked at usability and it's just so much nicer having the eGPU because the scene is fluid, it moves really smoothly. There's no stuttering or delay, it's very responsive. So yeah, you know, modeling, animating, whatever. If you're manipulating the 3D view with large scenes like I am in this example, just so much nicer having an eGPU accelerate it. It's just a much, much better experience. I also checked out ProRender's viewport rendering, which was surprisingly quick and fluid as well, given that ProRender is an add-on, it's not compiled into Blender. It did slow down occasionally, uh, especially when adding new stuff to the scene, but that's expected. It has to sync everything to the graphics card. But other than that, it was really great to use. And this is all footage of the eGPU because the CPU on my Mac just could not do this at all. The next application I looked at was DaVinci Resolve 17, which I use for all my video editing because I love it. And I shot some 4K footage, plus I also used some 1080p footage. And these clips, I basically wanted to do some benchmarking with for rendering and transcoding to see what the difference in performance was. And the results showed that when using the H.264 codec, the eGPU was anywhere from twice as fast to about five times as fast as the MacBook on its own. But when it came to H.265, the eGPU was way faster, or should I actually say that the MacBook was way slower? And the reason for that is basically because the MacBook does have hardware support for H.264, but it does not for H.265. So the MacBook is really, really bad at anything to do with H.265. But I suppose the experience from this is now the eGPU has extended the usability of my MacBook for doing 
any kind of editing because I now have access to H.265. Before I just I just wouldn't bother. It was just terrible. Also, apparently I might be able to edit in 8K. Now I don't have any footage, but I ran DaVinci Resolve's benchmark, which comes with it, and it basically tests Blackmagic's own video format. So it's their proprietary Blackmagic RAW format. And apparently if I was using this on this machine, I might be able to edit in 8K, although I may only get about 22 frames a second. But still, that's a tantalizing thing. The next thing I tried was adding a effect to a clip and seeing if I could get it to play back at full speed, which is something I really haven't had much success with with the MacBook on its own. Now, thankfully, all of the workload is now being transferred to the eGPU, so they do play back in full time. It just doesn't seem so from this footage. And the reason for that is because I've noticed screen capture really starts to lag things. So if I'm using QuickTime or OBS to do any kind of either screen capture or streaming from the MacBook, it just doesn't work. The eGPU just doesn't take that load for some reason. And it results in quite spotty playback as well. I'm not exactly sure of the technical reason for this, but all I can say is when I'm not screen capturing, which you can't see, because I have to capture the screen to show it to you, um, the playback for this particular clip with the D-banding on was pretty much perfect apart from occasional stutters when it was loading footage from the disk because I'm using an external disk which is a platter drive so it's a little bit slower and has to seek from time to time but other than that it's really really good and again it's made it possible to experiment with a whole bunch of new effects and actually be able to see them work in real time and tweak them in real time which I couldn't do before so big thumbs up again here for the eGPU. Last thing I wanted to try was to play some games. I, I like gaming occasionally, and I wanted to see if the Macintosh could actually run some titles and if the eGPU would make them better. A couple of problems though, the first one is the Macintosh system doesn't really have a huge number of titles available for it in the first place. And the second thing I found was not every title actually uses the eGPU, even though it's recognized by the operating system. They actually, I think, have to be designed to do it. So, but this one does. This is Inside from 2016, and I really enjoy playing it, um, although I'd made a few mistakes like falling to my death, but doing a perfect split on landing. So, you know, some good, some bad. The experience was actually pretty good. I could basically send the game onto like a much bigger monitor. It played perfectly at 60 frames per second, um, had no issues there. So I guess if you can find a title that will use the eGPU, yeah, you can game on you know a MacBook, which is from like seven years ago and still play some titles. Having said all that though, I have to be realistic. I don't think I'll be playing any AAA titles on this particular setup, or at least not at stupidly high frame rates. You know, people like Steve from Gamers Nexus have done a lot of work showing that CPUs and RAM do affect the maximum frame rate that you can get. You know, your CPU and your RAM can actually bottleneck your GPU and then you won't get the full performance out of it. And the same applies for creative apps like Blend and Resolve. During the time that we had using this eGPU, we've come across several situations where the eGPU has been bottlenecked because the host system has either run out of RAM or it's only using the CPU for certain things, which is really dragging down the performance. So whether you'd want to upgrade by just plugging in an eGPU really comes down to the kind of things you'll be doing. If you're using apps which require a lot of RAM, you need to make sure your host system has a lot of RAM. Or if you're running apps which have a lot of stuff that happens on the CPU and one or two critical things which you can push to a GPU, you might want to check if your CPU is reasonably adept at doing those particular tasks. Because otherwise you're going to spend money on something which may not actually get a lot of use during those particular tasks. And it's obviously going to waste your money and be frustrating. Finally, I want to look at the question of whether this upgrade option has value for money compared to, let's say, building a new PC, for example, or maybe buying a new host system like another laptop. Now the enclosure sells for about 550 Australian or $400 US depending on where you shop, which means that if I'm comparing this to let's say building a new PC, I have to have the components for that new system less the graphics card come in at under $400 US. And I decided I'd actually give this a shot. So I went over to M-Wave Australia's website and attempted to configure a PC for about the same cost as the Razer Core X. For the most part, while I was specifying the components for this PC, I was literally just looking for parts that were in stock that were the cheapest ones available. The only exception I made to that was RAM. Now my MacBook only has 8GB of RAM, so I really wanted to see if I could come in under $550 or thereabouts and actually get a system with 16 gigabytes of RAM because that would actually be really advantageous for me personally. If you wanted to do apples for apples, you can go back and do this experiment yourself and just choose eight gigabytes of RAM. However, I found by the time I'd actually got to the checkout, I'd already got to $550 and I was still missing a couple of bits. So you can see all the parts um, here on the screen that I was choosing. They literally were the cheapest ones. And I got to $555 and thought, great. But then I still needed to add like a monitor, a keyboard and a mouse. 
and also an operating system if I wanted to choose Windows. I could go with Linux, but if I wanted Windows, it's an extra $90. The grand total then comes out at $740 Australian, but I don't have Windows installed and I also have to build this computer myself. If I want Windows and I want M-Wave to build it for me, that's another $90 for the operating system and another $200 for the build, which then means that this solution is now $500 more expensive than the eGPU, which actually makes this a lot less clearer which is the better option. I mean, that money could go towards purchasing a much better GPU, or I could put it towards ditching the MacBook and going with the PC. I also want to point out, I'm not advocating for any particular upgrade path here. What's going to be best for you is really going to depend on your own personal circumstances. Speaking personally, for me, the PC option deals with all of the shortcomings of the current MacBook platform that I'm using. I can upgrade the RAM, I can upgrade storage, and I can upgrade the CPU. All things I can't do with MacBook and all things that it desperately needs in order to not bottleneck the GPU. Another option I considered was upgrading to the Apple Silicon based Macintoshes. However, they have a few issues. One being the maximum amount of RAM you can get is 16 gigabytes. And I've frequently gone past that in Blender. So that's a no go zone for me straight away. Also, they don't support eGPUs at the moment and there's not really much sign that they might. So if you do need extra power, you're stuck with having to upgrade again. Also, storage for me is an issue. You're capped at a maximum of two terabytes of internal storage and those two terabytes are actually quite expensive as well. For this particular model, it's gonna set you back 1200 Australian dollars. Whereas with a PC, you could buy the same storage arguably for a better performance for about half that cost. PCs also are far more flexible. If you find that you need to change components or upgrade them later on, you can always do that with ease. Whereas with the MacBook, after spending all that money on it, once you leave the store, you're stuck with it pretty much the way it is forever. All right, final conclusions time. So I'm gonna cover two things real quick. First is which upgrade option I'm gonna go for personally. And second is what do I think about the Razer Core X as a product? So my preferred upgrade option is actually gonna be the PC. And that's mainly due to the fact that the MacBook is not a great host system. It's not got enough RAM and I can't do anything about that. And the CPU is also pretty weak by today's standards. In fact, having the eGPU has brought this out even more because now that a lot of other things are suddenly faster, it's really showing up where its limitations are. Point number two, what do I think of the Razer Core X as a product? Now, a disclaimer, this is the only eGPU I've ever used. So my experience of them is a sample of one. Having said that, it's a very sturdy unit. It's mostly metal construction, which is really important in my household. You know, I've got little kids and also I'm a bit of a klutz. So, you know, strong construction is what's needed around here for sure. Also, the internal power supply is about 600 watts, I think, sustained and 650 watts peak, which means you should be good up to even the very power hungry 3080 card from NVIDIA. So that's pretty impressive. Also, it's been really great to have it for a while and be able to sort of evaluate its performance over time. And it's never missed a beat. It's never had any issues. It's never sort of like, you know, stopped working or done anything weird. So that's pretty good. Not so much for the MacBook, unfortunately, but you know, that's just, that's just life. But where it's really, really had an impact is in what I think is its niche where you can just plug it into a host system and it can deliver power instantly without having to change the host system one iota. Are there any improvements I would make to this product? Yes, one. I think I would add an extra PCI Express slot into the enclosure so you could have the option of a second graphics card in there. I think that would be really, really cool. This is purely me being selfish because I want as much rendering power and as compact a form factor as I can get. And the chassis itself looks like it could easily accommodate two cards. It's just the packaging that would need to change. But this is obviously the choice of the designers. And for all I know, that might make thermals a little tricky to manage. Um, I reckon you could probably get around that, but who knows, maybe the next model could come out with two slots and obviously two is better than one in my books. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. And if you found it useful, why not give it a like or even a subscribe and share it around with other people who you think might find it interesting or otherwise helpful. Otherwise, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.